All right, so this one here is from the dragon, and uh, the blind dragon to be precise, and it's an end game of his, and it looks like it's white to play, and let me scroll up to see if he had a specific question about it. I think it was probably like, you know, did he have an advantage or a disadvantage? How should the end game finish? Do, do, do. If you could win the ending position. You were black in the ending position. Okay, so since you only sent me... Since you only sent me the ending position, I don't see like the full game. I can't answer the question about... I can't answer the question about where you messed up during the game. I can only answer your question about whether or not you can you can press for a win in this end game position. So let's do that. Um, materially speaking, you've got a bishop and three bad pawns against a rook. That is certainly an advantage. That is certainly an advantage, a minor material advantage. It could very well be like dead equal with how bad your pawns are. Um, don't worry about it. It could obviously be an it could obviously be dead equal with how bad the pawns are, but certainly there's like very little danger of losing this kind of position as black. The reason I say your pawns aren't very good is because you don't really have any obvious way to make a past pawn, right? Um, it's not that white's about to attack and capture your pawns. There's two different weaknesses to doubled pawns, and you have doubled pawns. So let's let's mention this real quick. There's defensive weakness and offensive weakness. So sometimes you have doubled pawns, and your opponent can basically lay waste to them, right? Siege them, blockade them, attack them, boom. Uh, according to what he sent me, I think it's actually white's turn, not his. Uh, which seems right, because if it's his turn, probably f3 is very strong for him, right? So I think it's probably white's turn. Maybe he made a move here and offered a draw, and white accepted it. You know, like bishop to d6, last move, and offers a draw. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so there's defensive weakness, where your doubled pawns get attacked and killed. But there's also offensive weaknesses. So there's the inability of your doubled pawns to attack the opponent can be their weakness. So you're not going to like have your pawns taken from you, but you're not going to be able to use them to destroy your opponent. Oh, he flagged here. Okay. You're not going to be able to use them to crush your opponent. If you flag, then it's probably your move and it would be black's move. I don't know. If it's black's move, then I think we've got a pretty simple answer for you. Yes, you can win with F3 check. So I'm going to assume that it's white's move. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, I'm going to assume it's white's move, and the white's next move would be either king h3 or rook d6 or rook f3. We'll get into that in a moment. So offensive weakness, you've got three on one on the king side, and it's not even obvious how you can make a passed pawn, right? So one of the biggest weaknesses of doubled pawns is that they're bad as a pawn majority for advancing and making a passed pawn. It was white to move, but you flagged. I don't know how you can flag on your opponent's turn, but all right. Um, in this case, you have these sort of pawns that are, that are hampered. And if you guys remember this exchange Rui Lopez structure that we had a couple times today, um, let me see. Let's see if I can find my own completed games. Yeah, this is the one. All right, this is a good example of it, right? You guys see this? In this position where in general I was expecting white to use these two pawns here to play e5 and make a pass pawn. I have doubled pawns on the queen side, right? But if you look at my queen side, it's not defensively weak. Like this pawn mass is not easy for white to just like attack and win one of my doubled pawns, but it's offensively weak. In general, in these exchange variations of the Rui Lopez, what white is banking on 
is that it's very hard for black to make a pass pawn on the queen side. Do you guys see that and understand the two, the two different kinds of weaknesses, doubled pawns? Right? I'm not going to get attacked on the queen side, but my my weakness or my disadvantage or my disability here is not being able to properly attack on the queen side as I should be able to with an extra pawn there. Okay, so looking at this interesting position, let's see. Basically, if black's unable to change the pawn structure, they shouldn't have much of an advantage because they don't have obvious ways to make a pass pawn. I mean, they could sack a pawn possibly with h3 or f3 at some point to try and make white's g pawn move and turn the other pawn into a pawn weakness. The problem is both of these squares are light squares and white can recapture with his rooks or king in general, right? So if I play like king h3 for white and you play f3, I take with my rook, not my pawn. So you still don't have a passed pawn, right? So it's not it's not clear how black is going to make a passed pawn with any of these. If you don't have a passed pawn, I really don't see how you're going to beat white here. So let's think of the different ways you could make a passed pawn. Honestly, your three on one on the king side is so bad, I would turn my attention to the queen side. On the queen side, you have some chances of winning. On the queen side, what you have is two white pawns on the color square of this bishop. And if they're frozen like this, you might have the opportunity to bring your king in to attack them. Now, the king is a super strong attacking piece, and your opponent's king is completely cut off. And at some point, you could play rook g3 and trade off one rook, and then you've got king and bishop attacking the queen side against one rook. And a king's fighting power, locally speaking, is greater than a bishop and maybe a little bit less than a rook, but somewhere in the like four point range, the effective like fighting power of a king compared to a knight, a bishop, or a rook. Okay, so you could definitely have a plan of bringing your king to a4, then playing rook g3 at the right moment, trading one rook, and somehow breaking through on the queen side, whether it be with a5 or with bishop e5 to b2. Does that make sense so far? Um, I'm going to read a question. Why well, you guys tell me if that makes sense. So the question is, what trading strategy should black adopt if he wants to play for a win or draw according to the material? I.e., should black play to exchange a set of rooks off of the board or keep them on if playing for a win? Okay, very good question here. In general, in general, as Mr. Burns is saying, trading one rook would usually make this position more drawish. Because then white only has to protect things from a bishop. And there are certain ways you can set up your pawn so that they're more vulnerable to a bishop and less vulnerable to a rook, or so they're more vulnerable to a rook and less vulnerable to a bishop. And you can't fully commit to one of those structures or other um, as long as your opponent has both pieces. So you have to be prepared to deal with both. Additionally, when you've got a small advantage, you may need both your pieces for as much maneuvering to try and get errors out of your opponent. And finally, I believe your rook here is cutting off white's king. So right now, I believe one of the greatest factors in your favor is having the white king quite badly placed, which is part of the attraction of a plan of attacking on the queen side. So I think that trading rooks dramatically decreases your winning chances right now, even though my winning plan is to eventually trade the rooks. But I want to be so ready to eat up these pawns before I play rook g3 so that white's king has no choice of joining me or of getting counterplay by attacking all the kingside pawns. Okay? So we don't rush to trade that rook. If we want to win, we should play to keep all the pieces on the board and to activate our king. We basically already have two pieces that are maximally active. White has two pieces which are pretty well activated. And we each have a piece that isn't really involved. But it looks like you've got way better prospects of getting your king involved. So I would say the first plan here is to activate that king. You know, and if it were white's move, you know, one of the things they might like to do is actually play this move b5 to keep your king in. And, you know, if you play like a6, they can play like a4. Um, and they're keeping your king in, and now their pawn's not on a square attacked by your by your bishop. And if you want to eventually make a pass pawn here, you have to trade once, and then try and like move your bishop, and then find a chance where you can play c6 as well, and trade another pawn. So you're being forced to trade off a lot of pawns, which increases black white's chances of getting that draw. Okay. So unfortunately, you can't play b5 on the first move because f3 check should probably still win. I think f3 tends to win. So I think white should avoid it. 
but um, in response to F3, it's true that the last move you can play to try and solve drawn is rook takes d6, right? And now black plays rook g2 check, king here, c takes d6. And basically, the threat from black is to win with like f2, rook g1 at some point here, right? Like if you play king here, you can play this. Um, if you play rook takes d6, he can play rook g3, king h4, f2. A direct win, right? If king takes, you queen. And if the rook comes down, rook g1. I mean, I suppose you could prevent rook g1 with king f2 for the moment. Play, Let black play f2, rook d1 take on a3 and black has ample material to win this end game right um also the a pawn's going nowhere so maybe he just plays f4 f3 and keeps you bottled up i don't know hey drevland you were in my king's gambit course that was like a once in a lifetime kind of event that was um that was one of the highlights of my teaching career. I really enjoyed that. So hopefully it was not a low light of your chess learning career. Because <laughs> if my best is your worst, then that does not ring well. So I don't think rook takes d6 saves white against f3 check, right? This seems like convincingly enough pawns for black to win. Not to mention that like rook a3, rook b3, rook b5, and sacking all your kingside pawns and letting white's king out is still a win. So we go back a moment and we do not allow f3 and b5 is not a candidate move right away. So white's candidate moves are rook f3, king h3, and just taking on d6 immediately. If white feels really threatened, this is definitely an option. The problem with this option is, well, there's probably more than one problem with this option. But the main problem is just black attacking over here, I think. So like here, here, here takes, takes i mean black's up two pawns here in a rook end game right like i managed to play f3 and like fix your pawn structure so i can play rook h4 rook a3 as white and be down two pawns or i can play like a4 h3 and be down two pawns as white either way i think it's a lost rook and pawn ending so this is definitely this is, I'm going to say like 98% chance loss for white from here. Okay. We'll leave it at that for the moment and not analyze this rook end game out in detail. Um, we will say, uh, we will answer another question from Blind Dragon, which is from the starting position here. Would I have any fear OTB that I might lose? In other words, is this a three result position or a two result position? I don't know if you guys are familiar with that terminology. It's very important for like the professional chess community. There are positions which they call two result positions, which means basically you're playing for a win or a draw. In other words, if things don't go well, the worst that can happen is a draw. If your brain doesn't fall out on the table and you like, you know, hang your queen to a pawn, um, basically there's no way that if everything goes wrong, you could lose. It would still just be a draw. Ah, Tiger Gut, I remember you. All right, so, um, and then a three result position is a position where you're pressing, where you might be pressing for a win, but if things don't go your way, you could actually lose, okay? Like your opponent has the type of counterplay or the type of complicated position where you could actually lose the game, all right? So, I would say that this position does fall into the two result kind of position, blind dragon, meaning that you can't lose this. Um, or at least I couldn't lose this. <laughs> Sorry, you're asking from my perspective and that's from my perspective. I couldn't lose this. If I were playing this position as black, 
with you know an hour on my clock and my opponent had an hour on the clock and my opponent were Magnus Carlsen, I don't think I could lose this game as black. Um, the thought of losing would probably not even enter my my mind, I don't think. Um, it seems very secure because for white to win, white would have to make a passed pawn, right? Same thing as I said, like if you want to win this position, you need to make a passed pawn. If white's going to win this game, white needs to make a passed pawn. And how's white going to how's white going to make a passed pawn here? It just it seems impossible, right? I mean, this bishop and f pawn on their own can hold back the g pawn, so that can't be a passed pawn. And then on the queen side, you've got a very safe three pawns with your king against two. No. Honestly, you could take off the h and f pawns, and you'd have very good chances of drawing against the grandmaster as black. So, yeah, Magnus can do weird stuff in the endgame. I can't, I can't even predict his moves. Maybe anyone other than Magnus. I don't know how he would do it. It's true. But, but like, legitimately, like, you should not really... I, I would not. My answer to your question is I wouldn't even consider that I could lose this position. Okay. Um, okay. So now let's like talk a little bit about how you could win this for like five minutes. Just like let's just play out one or two variations to see what a plan might look like. And then we'll move on to our next segment, which will be some, some blitz games. Okay. So let's just have a quick look at what it might feel like. So I'm going to try playing rook f3 for white here instead of king h3, right? I told you there were three candidate moves here to avoid f3. One is taking, one is rook f3, and one is king h3. Well, my thought is if I ever want to get this king into the game, it's actually going to have to be like this. So that means I need my rook to be the one stopping the f and h pawns, okay? So I'm going to try one line with rook f3. We're just going to try some moves. Now for black, I'm going to try just bringing the king up. Um, like this. So real quick, let's just see that white can't keep the king out probably because of this, right? Unless there's anything wrong with this. This would be bad. Let's see. Um, does rook c1 do anything? I just come back and head for a5. Um, this is defended. This is defended. And I can just come back, right? So no a4. Okay, and I went through here instead of here just to stop rook d5. Um, you know, you could try another variation like this, but then white has this move. And it cuts off your king, and he wants to take this. It could be a problem. I mean, you can probably play rook g5 and just defend everything for the moment, but I'm going to go king c6. And then for white, I'm not going to play a4. I will play king 2, g1. <laughs> All right. We're good so far. Now we just have to check that this doesn't allow h3. And it looks like it doesn't, right? That just loses everything. So king g1, black to play from here. All right, so now I can consider king b5, but I have to calculate this move a little bit. So king b5, rook check, king here, rook f5. Clear so far? Now we have to go after these pawns, right? That's all we're going for. So we go rook g3. Um, your b5 check line would be similar to this, except without the b4 pawn, because black was still planning to come up. Um, so like where I played king g1, trying to start improving the white king. If you do this, I take, you come here, I come here, you take, I come here. So I already won your A pawn and your B pawn is gone, right? And then I've got three connected passers and a bishop against a rook. Um, and there's nothing on the king side for you. So that's that's definitely a cold theoretical win. That's like game over. I would guess the last chance would be check here, check here, rook h4, rook g7. But this should also be just dead. Um... So let's play let's play king g1 since I'm going to play king b5 for you anyway probably. So king g1, I want to play king b5, check here takes rook here. Okay. So now
Okay, Travis says that White could also play a defense where he doesn't send his rook to take f5, and I agree. We can we can look at a line of that as well. Um, so here, rook g3, it looks like we've won the a-pawn at this point, right? So the relevant line now becomes something like, well, there's rook takes g3, h takes g3, b5 trying to restrain these pawns still, king here, king here, king here. King here, king here, king here, a6 takes here. So this would be like one option. You could get to this position. There may have been an even better idea for black, but this is winning for black already as is. So it's good enough. So I'm not going to go back and find a better way to win. Okay, guys. Um, even though I suspect that there was a better way. I mean, I just played like super, super simple plan, right? Just like straightforward, like trying to make pass pawns in the simplest way possible. I didn't use any F3 tactics or nothing. Um, and this position looks pretty close to loss for white. It also looks like absolutely no chance to lose, right? Two result position, like we said. All right, so another plan for white. He could also sack an exchange at this point. But if he does, I think black now throws in the move H3 and then white loses. You win the pawn on g2 and on a3. And that should be finito, right? So, <clears throat> so the next plan is to not bring up the rook and to just wait. But if you just wait and keep your rooks connected, g3 is such a strong point. I can always play rook g3. So I go king here, here. Um... So now maybe here I'll start to encroach with rook g3, just starting to limit what white can do. And say so white could take, take. White doesn't especially want to take because this pawn majority gets better, right? There's breakthroughs now aplenty. Um, bring the king up. Yeah, if the king comes over to the queen side to defend the queen side, then you can win like this probably. Right? That feels like a win. Um, and alternatively, white well, could leave the king on this side of the board. And then... I guess I'd play a5, pawn takes, king takes, then come back here. I'm winning, right? <laughs> so I think you were winning this endgame, Blind Dragon. Um, there's more variations that could be explored with more time. You think king f2 and white was winning? Blunder a winning line for white? I was wondering about it. All right, so it's this position here. You want to play king f2 now, and then king a3, h4, king b2, h5, this thing. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't calculate this out, though I considered it. And yeah, you're right. It doesn't look good for me. I mean, it's not winning for white, certainly not. Certainly not winning for white. I can always just come back here and cover that pawn and advance these. I'm probably still winning, but it's like a mess if I sack both of these. So I probably had an easier way to win this one. Um, like c5 check first. And then h3 next move. Should win. So yeah, overall, Blind Dragon, I'm not going to go into like every single variation because there's going to be a lot of details. But in general, my feeling is you were winning this game. 
And I think that the strategy for doing so is actually pretty straightforward, like I suggest, right? If we look at the starting position, um, you know, basically you want to bring your king to a4. If they go after f5, that doesn't actually hurt you, so don't worry about that. So you bring your king to a4 and you attack these pawns, and then you can play rook g3 at the right time to trade the rooks and break through on a3. And you can play b5 and a5 to make a pass pawn if you have trouble breaking through there. But eventually you'll win, you'll win a pawn for free on this side of the board. You might win both of them, or if you have to play a5, you'll trade your a pawn for both of them. And you have two pass pawns left, and you'll win with those on that side of the board. So I'm reasonably convinced that you can win this with best play. And hopefully I could win it against uh, Carlson like we were talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's um let's get in half 